coming up on this Monday edition of Newsline at Noon. Korea's rival political parties begin their month-long review of next year's budget. If they miss the deadline, the government's draft proposal will be automatically referred to Parliament on December 1st. Government sources in Seoul say North Korea has reportedly launched a new submarine capable of firing ballistic missiles. But they say the North has not yet acquired the technology to deploy such missiles from it. First, the UN-backed panel warns fossil fuels will have to be phased out by the year 2100 to protect the world from dangerous climate change. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Monday, November 3rd here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Ah Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story today, lawmakers in the National Assembly are tasked with the very important duty of reviewing next year's budget. Mm -hmm. And considering the very frosty atmosphere in recent months, the rival parties are expected to clash over a number of issues. Ji Myung Gil reports. Discussions on next year's budget have begun at the National Assembly, with the ruling and opposition parties promising to pass it by the legal deadline of December 2nd. The 2015 budget calls for a 5.7 percent on-year increase in government spending to some 350 billion U.S. dollars. We must meet the legal deadline, as it is our last best opportunity to boost Korea's economy. The ruling's Henry party says the budget promoted by the government as necessary for boosting the economy must be kept intact. But the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has been stepping up its attacks on the government's recent expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, promoting its own plan instead. We have five principles set for next year's budget. Endorsing financial health for the central and local governments, restoring corporate taxes for conglomerates, increasing household income, and securing a bigger budget for safety-related purposes. Compounding concerns about the increased budget plans, the government has been facing a shortfall of tax revenue since 2012. According to the finance ministry, the government collected $126 billion in national tax revenue from January to August, which is down to $178 million from the same period last year. And while both parties are speaking in optimistic terms about the budget being passed by December 2nd, Korea's parliament is notorious for its year-end budget wars. No budget bill has been passed by the legal deadline since 2002. And at the National Assembly on this Monday, lawmakers are questioning top officials from government ministries and offices related to foreign affairs as well as unification and security issues. Topping the agenda was the recent agreement reached between South Korea and the United States on delaying the transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul. The ruling party says the extension was necessary to counter North Korea's nuclear threats, while the main opposition party demanded an apology from President Park Geun-hye for breaking her campaign pledge. South Korean activists flying of anti Pyongyang leaflets across the border, which led to the cancellation of planned high level inter Korean talks last week, is another issue set to come up. North Korea has a new piece of military hardware that could spell some trouble for the region. Military and government sources in Seoul say North Korea has launched a new submarine which seems to be capable of firing ballistic missiles. Connie Kim reports. In what appears to be a new threat from North Korea, Pyongyang has reportedly launched a new submarine capable of firing ballistic missiles. Government and military sources in South Korea say Pyongyang has imported a Soviet-era golf-class diesel submarine built in the 50s and modified it. Sources say the newly launched vessel is identical to an unidentified submarine at the Shimpo shipyard that the U.S.-based website 38 North revealed last month. 
The new vessel is estimated to be 67 meters long, 6.6 meters wide, and has a dive displacement in the 3,000 ton range. Adding to the concern about the new submarine is the operation of a test facility at the Shinpo shipyard that 38 North reported in October. It was reported the North has carried out dozens of tests on the ground and at sea to mount a missile tube on the vessel. A military source in Seoul says Pyongyang's new submarine will pose a threat if the North completes testing for a vertical launch of missiles, estimated to take two years at most. To counter the threat, South Korea plans to launch three 3,000-ton submarines with vertical missile launch tubes by 2020 and an additional three by 2030. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has praised China for doing more to pressure North Korea. Speaking on Bloomberg News, Kerry said the Chinese were being helpful by taking measures way beyond where they were a year ago. He cited the examples of China reducing the amount of jet fuel going into the country and setting limitations on trade with the North. Kerry also pointed out that Chinese President Xi Jinping has held five or six meetings with South Korean President pa uh, Park Geun-hye but none with Kim Jong-un. The top U.S. diplomat also said Washington is as keen as Beijing to restart the long-stall six-party talks on the North's denuclearization, but stressed the U.S. needs assurances Pyongyang is prepared to discuss giving up its nuclear ambitions. Now, despite recent ruptures in inter-Korean relations, German lawmaker Hartmut Koshik, a longtime advocate for Korean unification, says North Korea still wants to talk to South Korea. Koshik was in Pyongyang for six days recently and he held talks with some powerful people there, the chairman of the Supreme People's Assembly and also the country's vice foreign minister. This all before he paid a visit to us here in Seoul last week. Our Hwang sung sat down with him for a chat. When you talked to North Korean officials during your stay there, what did they say about inter-Korean relations? Many of the North Korean officials I spoke with were very clear. North Korea hopes to improve relations with South Korea. The attendance of three high-level officials at the closing ceremony of the Asian Games shows this very well. They said rebuilding trust is the most important step for improving South-North relations. As the basis for trust building, they referred to former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung's visit to North Korea in 2000 and the June 15th joint statement that followed. There are speculations about the regime instability in North Korea. What was your impression? Of course, Kim Jong-un's power cannot be compared to that of his father, Kim Jong-il, in his prime. But he has enough leverage to control the current situation. The power is not held solely by him, though. It is divided among other agents, such as the party, the military, or the economic bodies. But Kim is able to maintain a balance among them. However, I do see a need for a policy to promote overall stability. So before your visit to Pyongyang, you also visited China and you met with officials there. Did you have any talks about North Korea with them? There are tensions between North Korea and China. China wants North Korea to return to the six-party framework and to pursue more reform measures on its own. But at the same time, its biggest interest is securing stability in North Korea and on the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, Beijing is not opposed to Pyongyang's relations with Europe and Berlin. And China believes its friendship with South Korea is helpful in maintaining stability on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. You've been a long-time advocate of the unification of the two Koreas. Uh, in your view, what's the biggest hurdle to the Korean unification, and how do we make that leap? The challenge can be largely divided into two. First is solving the dire humanitarian situation in North Korea. The second, and the most important and difficult task, is North Korea's nuclear program. The neighboring countries must also be considered. A fundamental step is resolving tensions between the two Koreas, but at the same time, seeking understanding from the United States, China, and Japan remains a challenge. And where does Germany come in? Germany will not be a mediator, it will also not be a master that can offer a great deal of knowledge. But what we can do is to give little bits of advice based on our own experience with unification. Thank you, Mr. Koshik, for your time today. It was a pleasure for me. <laughs>
Some interesting insights there. Now, Japanese nationalism has been running up quite a dangerous head of steam in recent years, and the Abe administration, the ruling Im 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 uh, administration there in Japan, uh, while reacting first to ensure somewhat uh, of, of a distorted view of history, has been dragging its feet about clamping down on hate rallies, which includes hostility against ethnic Koreans living in Japan. Now, in an attempt to, to counter the mood, hundreds of citizens took to the streets of Tokyo on Sunday to protest against this kind of racial discrimination. Our Sun Jung-in reports. Around 1,000 people from different ethnic backgrounds gathered on Sunday to march against the hate speech at a rally in Tokyo's bustling Shinjuku district. The participants wanted to spread a positive message in opposition to hate rallies, holding signs urging peace and reconciliation. They even chanted a song that called for an end to discrimination against Koreans living in Japan. I took part of this rally because we should not allow hate speeches, not only from Koreans and Chinese, but also from us Japanese. In August, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination called on Tokyo to firmly address manifestations of hate and racism, as well as incitements to racist violence and hatred during rallies. However, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party is lukewarm about legislating a law against such rallies under the pretext of the freedom of speech. The opposition Democratic Party of Japan plans to submit a bill that prohibits racial discrimination within this month. Do you know how Japan is perceived around the world? There is a strong belief we are way behind in terms of the human rights issue. While the Shinzo Abe administration drags its feet over legislating a law against racial discrimination, it plans to promptly take action to ban a textbook that says the Japanese military forced women into sex slavery during World War II. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, one of Samsung Group's oldest founding companies is set to go public by the end of the year, setting the stage for more Samsung affiliates to quickly follow suit. Now, this also paves the way for Samsung Electronics to establish a holding company early next year. And our Song ji explains what Korea's biggest conglomerate is hoping to achieve through this process. Tail Industries, the mother company of Samsung Group that was founded six decades ago, is going public. Tail filed for an initial public offering of around $50 per share to the Financial Supervisory Service on Friday, with plans to go public on December 18th, earlier than the market forecast of the first quarter of next year. Just days before Tail's listing, Samsung's IT services subsidiary, Samsung SDS, also filed for an IPO on December 14th with a starting stock price of $185 per share. Market analysts view this as a means of speeding up the group's restructuring to found a Samsung Holdings company that could eventually shore up control for the conglomerate's family members. One of the most plausible scenarios is that Samsung Electronics splits in two in the first quarter of next year, with one becoming a holdings company and merging with Tail Industries. Now why go through with this process? Because this way, the heir apparent to the Samsung throne, Lee Jae-yong, who owns a quarter of Tail Industries' share as its biggest shareholder, can minimize inheritance taxes with his share of Tail stocks dropping to 8 percent. At the same time, he increases the influence in Samsung Electronics as his current share of 0.6 percent jumps to that same level. Song Ji-sun. Arirang News. Now, Korea's favorite messaging application, Kakao Talk, is stretching its boundaries and aiming to go global, backed by new services and its recent merger with Internet Portal down. But this has many analysts and uh, just people in general asking whether this will be enough to win over consumers outside of Korea. Our Shin Se-min has this week's industry insight. Nine out of ten smartphone users in Korea use KakaoTalk, the country's number one mobile messaging service. In Korea, you don't say, I'll text you, you say, I'll ka-talk you. But it's not stopping there. The services KakaoTalk offers are expansive and growing all the time. 
Users can send small amounts of money, go shopping, and even send gifts and vouchers. Kakao Talk is also able to connect small businesses with their customers. Soon, it aims to roll out features that allow users to call a taxi and control their home appliances and even help drivers find an empty parking spot. We already have a solid platform here at Kakao, but we never stop innovating, and extra features are in the works all the time. By making use of Taum's established portal, we're looking to provide more state-of-the-art services that will eventually be used in our daily lives. KakaoTalk merged with Korea's second-largest internet portal, Daum Corporation, this year and went public last month. Town Kakao currently has a market capitalization of over 7 billion U.S. dollars, making it one of the country's largest IT firms. Under its new slogan, Connect Everything, Town Kakao is hoping to lead the march to have everything connected to the Internet. A personalized location-based service is under development, drawing on the strength of each arm of the business. By utilizing Town's pre-existing and highly detailed map service, Kakao Talk hopes to launch a feature that notifies users when they're near a restaurant chain or clothing store they like. However, as with any company that has global aspirations, challenges lie ahead, namely convincing international consumers to make the jump to Kakao Talk. Down Kakao missed the boat for entering the global market. Countries already have their preferred messaging services. In China, they like WeChat. Line is in Japan, and WhatsApp has a grip on the U.S. It's going to be really hard for Down Kakao to squeeze in between. The company also has problems closer to home after Kakao Talk was rocked by a privacy scandal. A significant number of users abandoned Kakao Talk for foreign messaging applications like Germany's Telegram following the revelation that the Korean company had given prosecutors access to thousands of their users' private conversations. But it's only been a month since Daum and Kakao joined forces, and some say it's too soon to tell whether its success at home will translate into success overseas. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, a United Nations panel has issued a very comprehensive report on the environment and it paints a very bleak picture of what could be ahead. So for more on this and other global headlines we're following this hour, we're going to uh, connect to our Eunice Kim, who is standing by for us at the News Centre. You know, so the panel of scientists have proposed a very ambitious goal on climate change. Give us the details. Well, Chinju, that goal is cutting the global greenhouse gas emission rate to near zero by the end of this century, which is within the next 85 years. The panel warned a failure to act now could bring on irreversible damage. Our Kim Hyun Bin has the details. The United Nations climate body is warning that time is not on our side to stop soaring temperatures, making the world unlivable. Launching the latest study from the Environmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN said the world faces severe widespread and irreversible effects if moves are not made to completely stop using fossil fuels by 2100. It says the use of low carbon sources needs to rise from 30 percent of electricity generation now to more than 80 percent by the middle of the century to limit rising temperatures. The window of action is really closing very rapidly. If you look at the total carbon budget, to ensure that temperature increase by the end of this century will not exceed 2 degrees Celsius. We've already used up a substantial share of this. Scientists say a rise of 2 degrees Celsius is the level at which the dangerous impacts of climate change will be felt. But the IPCC says the world is at risk of temperatures soaring by 4.8 degrees or even higher by 2100 if things continue as they are. So this clearly shows that we have a very limited window of opportunity and I think the global community must look at these numbers and show the resolve by which we can bring about change. UN Secretary General Pang Gi moon also stressed the need for action before it's too late. Inaction of climate action will cost much, much more. This climate action and economic growth are 
full size of just one coin. The IPCC study will be the main handbook for 200 nations when they meet for a global summit on climate change in Paris late next year. China, the United States, the EU, and India are the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And on to other news now. An apparent suicide blast near a major border crossing connecting Pakistan and India has killed at least 45 people and wounded dozens of others. The bomber detonated himself around 6:15 p.m. local time on Sunday, following a daily flag-lowering ceremony that draws hundreds of people on both sides. Pakistanis were hit with the brunt of the attack as it took place 500 meters on their side of the border. Dozens of people used the The Wagga crossing every day as it serves as an important trade route. The Pakistani Taliban has claimed responsibility for Sunday strike. Voters in two rebel-held regions of eastern Ukraine went to the polls on Sunday to choose their head of state and members of parliament. Rebel-backed polls show that the incumbent prime ministers of Donetsk and Luhansk, a former electrician and a former consumer protection agency employee, were ahead in the polls and likely to keep their posts. Moscow has said it will back the results of the vote that Ukraine's president Petro Poroshenko has dismissed as a farce conducted under the barrels of tanks and machine guns. The European Union said the elections violate a September ceasefire agreement, while Washington also. Denounced the vote as illegitimate. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ajin Ju. <laughs> Now to some exciting cultural news, because Korea is poised to have a 17th item added to UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list, and it's called Nongak. Right, Nongak is a traditional music that used to be played by farmers to encourage cooperation during the busiest times of the year. Our Connie Lee introduces us to the world of Nongak. Drums, gongs, a parading, dancing, and acrobatic feats—it's all part of what is called nongak. It's traditional Korean music that was originally performed by farmers in the early 1900s. Scholars say it was first introduced during the Japanese colonization of Korea. Nongak was performed in groups to encourage one another to work better in the fields and to help them overcome the difficulties of agricultural life. But today. It is a popular performing art seen all around Korea, especially during the holidays. And in the coming weeks, this art is set to be tapped as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. This, after a UNESCO deliberative body made a unanimous decision to recommend Nongak. The unanimous recommendation is a very rare case. This is a great opportunity to share with the world the significance of Nongak. In a report on the deliberation, UNESCO says the music is characterized by vitality and creativity, providing performers and audiences with a sense of identity. The final decision will be made at the end of this month during a meeting at UNESCO's headquarters in Paris. Officials, however, say it is most likely that Nongak will be added to UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list as Korea's 17th item. Others on the list include Korea's folk song Arirang and Kimjang, or the making and sharing of kimchi. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Good afternoon. A cold wave advisory has lifted a couple of hours ago, but you know it felt like early winter this morning started out in the single digits, and strong gusty winds just made it feel colder than the actual temperatures. And the daytime high for this afternoon will only rise to mid teens in many regions. Well, it's bright outside under lots of sunshine, but temperatures will remain on the chilly side. So let's take a closer look at the readings for today. 
today. Now, the daytime high in the capital, Daegu and Gwangju, will top out at 14, while Busan will peak at 15 this afternoon. Now, on to other regions. Jeju Island and Daejeon will be getting up to 15 and 13, respectively, while Dokdo sees a high of 11. And it seems like the cold will ease up a bit tomorrow afternoon, with highs rebounding into the uh, seasonal averages, but temperatures will drop again at the end of the week. But that's all for now, and let's send it back to Mark and Jinju in the studio. Well, thank you very much, as always, for the weather there, Gian, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I'll be back at the same time on Tuesday. Thank you for watching.